bonjour. <laughs> I'm here today to talk about networking in Go. My name is Cindy, and I believe that Go is a fantastic language for right doing network services. Think chat servers, video streaming platforms, reverse proxies, and just plain old HTTP services capable of handling tens or hundreds of thousands of simultaneous connections. Now, I thought it would be really cool to understand how Go handles this, and that is what I'm here to talk to you about. This is the very simple Hello World example of an HTTP service in Go. Yet, the simple example can be used to understand the fundamentals of how network I.O. works in the world of MN scheduling in Go. Let's start with listen and serve. Arguably, this is one of the most widely used methods of the net package. So listen, as the name suggests, creates a listening socket. Now, for those who are unaware of what a socket really is, communication between different computers happens via sockets. A socket, essentially, is just a file descriptor. Now, the fundamental building block of all I.O. in Unix is a sequence of bytes. Most programs work with an even simpler abstraction, a stream of bytes, or an I.O. stream. A socket, essentially, is just a reference that a process has to a kernel data structure which can hold a stream of bytes. And what serve does is it accepts connections on the listening socket, and it starts a new Go routine for each connection. So what does it really mean to accept connections? Well, every time you accept a connection on a listening socket, you create a new socket. And the process that calls accept gets a new file descriptor back that references this new socket that's been created. If you call accept twice, again, the second time, you get a descriptor to another socket. Now, let us understand a little bit more about how Go handles network file descriptors. The fundamental data structure in the net package is one called netfd. This represents a network file descriptor. This descriptor is used for all forms of network connections TCP connections, UDP connections, and what have you. Now, if you actually look at the NetFD structure, it has a field called pole.fd. Now, that refers to another structure in the package pole, which is an internal package. And pole.fd essentially is a wrapper around the raw file descriptor that your kernel sends back to your process. Um, the net and the OS package both use this FD structure to represent a network connection or an OS file. Now, FD really is a network file descriptor that actually is ready for asynchronous I.O. using the network polar. Now, it's very important to understand that Every socket that Go creates for network connections is a non-blocking socket. What does that mean? Well, when a descriptor is set in the non-blocking mode, an I.O. system call on that descriptor will return immediately, even if that request itself cannot be immediately completed. If the socket were not a non-blocking socket, in that case, the thread Calling, making the I.O. system call would be blocked. So to really understand how the network polar works in Go, it becomes important to understand what the poll descriptor is. If you look at the structure FD, it has a field called the poll descriptor in addition to sysfd, which really refers to the system file descriptor that your kernel sends back. Now, what really is the poll descriptor? Well, it refers to a structure defined in the poll package, which holds something called the runtime context. Now, what really is this runtime context? Well, to really understand that, we have to understand 
how multiplexing of I.O. works on most modern operating system. Most operating systems have mechanisms that allow a process to monitor multiple file descriptors at the same time and get notifications when I.O. is possible on them. The API exposed by the Linux kernel is called EPOL. On BSD and BSD-derived systems, this is called K-Event, and the descriptor that you get to a K-Event is called KQ, and on Windows, this is called the I.O. completion port. This talk is going to be using EPOL as an example to demonstrate how the Ghost Network Polar works to multiplex different network connections. Now, EPOL itself actually is not a system call. It really is a kernel data structure that allows a process to multiplex I.O. on multiple file descriptors. Essentially, when your process creates an EPOL instance, it gets a file descriptor back that refers to this instance. Using this descriptor called EPFD in this illustration, the process can then register more file descriptors with the EPOL instance. These file descriptors are set to be in the interest list of the EPOL instance. Now, when the file descriptors that have been registered become ready for I.O., they are set to be in the ready list. And a process can add more file descriptors to be monitored by this EPOL instance using a system call called EPOL Cuttle. Now, let's understand how all this fits in with the example that we've been looking at so far. We have a Go process that calls an accept on a non-blocking socket. The accept call creates a new socket and returns back to the Go process a descriptor referring to that socket. Incidentally, what also happens here is that this new socket that's been created gets registered with the EPOL instance. So every time you create a new network connection using Go, that file descriptor gets automatically added to the EPOL instance. If you call accept again, well, you create another socket, which again gets added to the EPOL instance. Thus, right now, we have two file descriptors in the EPOL instance's um, interest list. Now, coming back to the data structures used by Go, well, I told you that the runtime, to understand what the runtime context meant, we really had to understand how multiplexing of I.O. works. So runtime context really is just a registration of the file descriptor with the EPOL instance, which also stores certain other metadata, like which goroutine was the one that, call, that spawned the accept call, which re resulted in the file descriptor being registered with EPOL. Now, now that we have a base understanding of how we can monitor multiple file descriptors for I.O., let's understand what happens when a Go process tries to read data of a socket. There can be three outcomes when you try to perform I.O. on any non-blocking socket. The first outcome is that, well, the call succeeds, and you can read the entire result back. You can read all of the data back. In which case, the Go routine making that call can very well be on its merry way processing the data that it received. In the second case, we get a partial result back in that we might not have read all the bytes in the socket buffer, but some of them, but that still is okay because your Go routine can still process that information and do something with it. The third case, and the most interesting case, is when you get an error. So you get an error when the file descriptor that you're trying to read from is not ready for I.O. as yet, when there are no bytes in there that can be read. So what happens in this case is that the Go routine is parked. What do we mean by parking? Well, let's just recap Go's threading model, right? We have processors, CPU cores essentially, and these are represented by P, in the runtime um, terminology. And then we have operating system threads. 
these are represented by m. And it's important to know that at any given time, there can just be one m that's running, actually running on any processor. But there can be several other threads that are in just varying different states, even if only one can be running. Additionally, each processor also has its own local run queue of goroutines in the runnable state, which are waiting to actually hop on to this single operating system thread and actually start executing. In addition, there is also the global run queue, which is a, as the name suggests, a global queue of runnable goroutines, not specific to any particular process. So what happens when we park a goroutine is that the goroutine that is actually attached to the M in the processor gets removed, gets disassociated with that M. Its state is changed from running to waiting, because in this case, it's actually waiting for network I.O. It's waiting for more data to arrive before it can actually do something with it. And we then make a call to a function in the runtime package called schedule. Now, what does schedule do? Before we understand what schedule actually does, let us understand when this function essentially gets called, or rather, when does the runtime scheduler get invoked? It gets invoked in five different scenarios. The first is when we create a brand new operating system thread. We need to find a goroutine that can be run on that thread, so we call the schedule. Um, to park a goroutine, as we just observed, in which case the goroutine needs to be blocked, we need to remove a goroutine that's actually on a operating system thread, and we need to get another goroutine on that thread. So we obviously call schedule, because that decides which new goroutine is going to be, is going to make it to the operating system thread. And then every time we call runtime.gosched, that again is another call to schedule. What that means is that we're taking the currently executing goroutine, swapping it out, and we are essentially going to be swapping a new goroutine from the run queue into the operating system thread. There are two more instances when schedule gets called. One is when a goroutine finishes a syscall operation. And finally, when the goroutine exits. It's completed, whatever it has to do, you know, it's exiting, which means that that thread, the operating system thread on which it's running, can be used by a different goroutine. So the algorithm used for schedule is very simple. So now we understand when the scheduler gets invoked. Let us understand what really happens when we call schedule. Well, a certain fraction of times, but not always, we check the global run queue for runnable goroutines. This happens only 161% of the times. And this happens primarily to give all the goroutines a fair chance of getting scheduled, because otherwise, the second highest priority, or rather the topmost priority, is for the local run queue. And if we don't account for the first case, we could potentially land in a scenario where two goroutines are constantly spawning each other and are essentially hogging up the single thread. So we first check for the global run queue. Then we look if there are any, if we don't find any in the global run queue, we check if there are any runnable goroutines in the local run queue. If you do find it, well, that's the goroutine that gets scheduled. In the third case, if we do not find anything in the local run queue, we check the global run queue again. Now, this might seem slightly confusing because we're checking the global run queue the first time and the third time, but it's important to understand that the first check only happens a fraction of the times, not always. So if it doesn't happen, then we again have to execute the third case, in which case we check for a runnable goroutine in the global run queue. And if that doesn't work, if you don't find any goroutines there, we pull the network. What does that mean? Well, so as I just said, every new network file descriptor that gets created gets registered with the epoll instance. Polling a network essentially just means calling a function called epoll wait. What this function returns is just the list of all the file descriptors that are ready for I.O. What that also returns is a list of runnable goroutines, a linked list of runnable goroutines, goroutines which were previously blocked on I.O. but now are currently runnable. 
So what happens then is that the schedule method takes all but the first go routine in this linked list that's sent back and adds, this, adds these go routines to the global run queue. And finally, it takes the first go routine that was returned back and it schedules it for execution. So to recap, what really happens when we perform a network operation in Go is that every new network file descriptor that we create gets registered with the network polar during creation time. Second, when any I.O. operation returns an error in that when any I.O. operation potentially blocks, we park the Go routine. We potentially schedule the Go routine away from the main thread in which it's running, and we call it the schedule method so that we can find another runnable Go routine that can be then run on this thread. And finally, when we call schedule, we pull the network if we don't find any Go routines in the local or the global run queue. And once we pull the network, we get a list of all the Go routines that were previously blocked on network I.O. and can now be run. So if any of this seems exciting or interesting to you people, I would very highly recommend reading the Go source code, um, especially the net, the runtime packages, because it is an astonishingly approachable source code. It's extremely well commented, well explained, and there are a lot of facts that I had to gloss over simply because I did not have the time, but I would highly recommend anyone who really wants to know more about these ideas and these concepts and how Go works with primitives built on top of the operating system, please do go check out the source code. Yes, see. Thank you.